First of all, welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Elena Catalanotti um, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, biomass and carbon capture and storage today. Um, so this lecture wants to be really an introduction to um, give you an idea of where biomass uh, and car car carbon capture stand um, in the fight um, against global warming. Um, and um, so I'm not going to go too much into technical details at this stage, but of course, if you have any questions, um, uh, you can uh, write in the chat and then I'll try to answer to as many questions as possible at the end of the uh, lecture. Um, and alternatively, if you want more material, you can email me uh, and you'll find my email in the next slide. Right. Uh, so um, let's just start with a little bit interact of introduction about myself, about my background. Uh, I'm not a chemical engineer by the fault. I'm actually graduated in chemistry um, uh, some time ago now in Italy. Um, and then I moved to Leeds for my PhD where I uh, studied alternative aviation fuels, in particular biofuels, which come from um, plants um, and uh, synthetic fuels from fisher trout process uh, and I was comparing these alternative fuels to uh, traditional conventional jet fuel uh, which is mainly based on kerosene which is a fossil fuel. Um, then uh, I moved to my uh, first uh, postdoctoral position in low carbon technology still uh, but this time um, I worked on power stations with carbon capture and storage running techno-economic uh, analysis um, and also looking at comparing different fuels such as coal, biomass which we'll talk about today and natural gas. Uh, after quite a long break um, I then um, came back into research here at UCL about two years ago with the Daphne Jackson um, Fellowship. Okay, so this is all about me. Um, now let's have a look at what we're going to um, do today, this lecture. So as I said before, this, is, uh, this wants to give you quite a lot of uh, background um, interactive information about the problem. So um, we're going we're gonna to talk about the background, so what's the problem and how did we get here. Probably many of you will already know uh, some of um, uh, the information that I'll give you in this lecture, but I plan to extend on those and to give you um, some more knowledge about also uh, some keywords and terminology that you may read uh, probably in the newspapers and you may not be completely sure of what they mean. Uh, then we're going to look at um, what the potential solution is. So what's biomass? Um, as I said, terminology. So what is carbon negative? What does it mean? We talk about negative emissions. What do we mean by that? Um, what available uh, technologies exist at the moment? Biomass uh, combustion or gasification? What do they mean? Um, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide storage or utilization? And then, of course, um, as every technology, we're going to look at some challenges. OK, uh, every technology come with challenges, comes with questions. And really, the role of research is addressing those questions, try to answer those questions. Um, and then, of course, we'll wrap it up with some conclusions. We talk about negative emissions. Is it possible? So let's start with some background. Um, this graph um, shows the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere as um, they've been in the past 800,000 years, okay? Very long time, up until now, okay? So what this graph shows you is that for hundreds of thousands of years, the CO2 has been fluctuating, but has never reached levels above the 300 parts per million, this line here. Only in the past, let's say about 100 years, we had a peak in the rise of the um, CO2 levels, um, reaching um, levels of 417 parts per million as per May 2020, so last month, okay? 
Um, so we talk about an excess, an extra CO2 of about 100, 150 parts per million more CO2 than there should be at the equilibrium in the atmosphere. Uh, now, it might not look like um, a big quantity, but it actually uh, does create quite a lot of issues on the, um, you know, um, on the environmental uh, side, climate change and all the environmental issues that you're well aware of. Um, and if you look at the numbers, we are talking about a third more than what it should be as a maximum target, 300 parts per million, okay? So why is that? Where is this carbon dioxide coming from? Um, well, recent studies show that still um, power, of, so the energy sectors, various energy sectors, all together account for about 50% of the total uh, CO2 emissions. Um, so we're talking about power and heat, transport and other energy uh, related industries. And we know the reason. The reason is basically that for um, nearly 200 years, we've used fossil fuels as the main source of energy. And still studies, um, um, a statistical review from 2019, so very recent, last year, still shows uh, that we heavily rely on fossil fuels. Still now, only 13% of the energy consumption comes from um, renewables, while over 80% still comes from fossil fuels. So let's have a look at these fossil fuels, of why do they cause these problems? You're all very aware that uh, fossil fuels have formed in millions of years and they come from um, the, the decomposition of organic material, plants and animal waste that um, has undergone uh, very complex transformations over a very long time. Um, they are rich in hydrocarbons, which are compounds of hydrogen and carbon, and they store a lot of energy in those bonds, okay? The carbon that is contained in fossil fuel is often referred to as locked up carbon because it was locked underground away from what we call the carbon cycle that has been established for millions of years, okay? So once humans started to extract fossil fuels and burn it either in power stations or in vehicles, then they release this excess CO2, this new CO2, into the atmosphere. So this process um, is called carbon positive. Okay, so this is one of the uh, keywords, one of the terminologies that um, I'd like you to be familiar with. So carbon positive is, is nothing positive, there's nothing positive about it. It's more about the mass. Um, so we are adding carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this is where this excess 100, 150 parts per million of CO2 comes from. So, um, if we want to stop global warming, what do we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to stop or reduce the emissions, at least reduce, well, possibly stop the emissions, which means avoiding that new CO2 goes into the atmosphere, correct? So to do this, uh, there are, uh, well, a number of technologies that needs to be heavily implemented. Um, we are talking about the renewables, wind, hydroelectric, solar, fuel cell, biomass and biofuels, which are all zero emission carbon sources. Well, I put nuclear as well, but it's not a renewable. It is a zero emission carbon source. So we have, it does not emit, it does not emit any new carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. However, in this lecture, I'd like to push it a little bit harder. So the question is, what if we could reverse the trend? So we've been, um, we've been emitting new CO2 in the, into the atmosphere for 100 years. Can we remove some of this excess CO2 and try to go back to those um, uh, smaller, le um, smaller levels, so about 300 parts per million? Well, that's, you know, that would be the ultimate target. To do that, we need to use a substance that is able to um, capture the CO2 directly from the atmosphere. And what better substances than plants? You all know that plants, in order to grow, 
they use photosynthesis. So what do they do? They extract the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they absorb it. And then they use sunlight, so the energy from the sunlight, to combine the CO2 with the water to form, um, to form glucose. And uh, obviously they release oxygen. Now glucose, which is this molecule here, undergoes several transformation in the plant, polymerizations, and um, forms quite complex structures that basically are the material that makes up the plant, okay? Once the plant dies, that material becomes what we call biomass, okay? Um, it's important to think that in the process, the plant has absorbed a lot of energy from the sunlight and this energy is stored in these bonds. So once we, if we're able to break these bonds in a certain way, either through combustion or other um, technologies, um, techniques that we look at, um, then we release this energy. We can use this energy. Uh, so what is, bi is biomass then? Uh, if you look around, what could classify as biomass? Well, biomass is, as we said, the organic material derived from biological sources. So effectively, it's we're talking about wood chips, agricultural products, forest waste, food waste. So it is available everywhere and is a renewable because it forms all the time. We can never run out of, run out of it. Okay. Now let's have a look. Let's compare what happens if we use fossil fuels or if we use this biomass to generate our energy. So we've already had a look at this process very quickly, okay? But now in this slide, I have added some numbers which are completely arbitrary. They don't really mean anything, um, but they're just used there to um, show you what happens to the carbon, to show you a sort of carbon cycle, if you understand more or less what happens. So in a process that we call carbon positive, when we use the fossil fuels, let's say we extract, for example, 10 parts per million of carbon. Um, we extract it, we burn it, for example, in a power station, we nominally um, release 10 parts per million of carbon dioxide. This is new carbon dioxide that goes in the atmosphere. So the net balance of the process is plus 10 parts per million, and this is why it's called carbon positive. If we use biomass, the source of carbon is the CO2 in the atmosphere. So the plant absorbs 10 parts per million of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, it grows, then it dies, it becomes biomass, we can burn it. It will release back nominally again, 10 parts per million of carbon dioxide, okay? So the net balance here is minus 10 plus 10 is zero. So this is a carbon neutral system, which is, um, well, the effect is similar to what happens if we use wind or solar. So we are not emitting new carbon, but we're not all even reducing the carbon that is there, okay? We're not reversing the, um, the trend. So, if we use biomass again in the same way, so we absorb the 10 parts per million of carbon dioxide, we uh, convert the plant into biomass, then we burn it. If instead of releasing this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we manage to capture some of it, let's say 90% of it, okay? Um, so we then only release one part per million of carbon dioxide. The net balance is minus nine parts per million, so it's negative. And that's why we call this effect carbon negative, okay? But actually, this is the best outcome that we can look for within the three. This is what we want to focus on, trying to extract, absorb some of this carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and put it somewhere else. Now let's look at some technologies that are available at the moment. So, so far I've been talking about burning 
biomass, okay? This is probably the concept that is more familiar to you. So a way to use biomass is combustion. We uh, burn it with oxygen and we produce carbon dioxide and water as products. And obviously we produce a large amount of energy that we can use for electricity, for example. Okay, in this case, the capture of CO2 occurs um, through post combustion. So we burn and then we capture the CO2. We need to clean it from other uh, impurities and then we can uh, um, use it somehow or store it. Um, there are a number of established capture techniques. For example, we can, uh, we can capture um, uh, the CO2 with solvents or membranes. There are all sorts of things. I'm not going to go in details at this stage. But I'd like you to have a look um, at a project um, from Drax uh, Power Station in Yorkshire. Um, it's very interesting. So they aim to be the first energy uh, producer which goes completely carbon negative by 2030. So they started years ago um, burning coal in the power station. Then they moved to mixtures of coal and biomass. And then they're now moving to 100% biomass uh, from power station um, and they're adding uh, carbon capture. Okay, so they, um, and they aim to become 100% completely carbon negative by the end of 2030. Um, okay, so an alternative way to treat biomass instead of direct combustion is gasification. Not many of you, Mm, I think I've heard of this, but this is a completely different technique, is a completely different process, nothing to do with combustion. You treat solid uh, material, for example, biomass, in the presence of an oxidizing, oxidizing agent, which can be oxygen, but also air or steam. Um, but the conditions are very different from combustion and the outcome is very different. So we do this to produce a mixture of gases. Um, sorry. Uh, so a mixture of gases, um, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and small hydrocarbons that then can be used um, in, um, in various ways, can, can have very different applications. It's very versatile in us, yeah? So in particular, we can, for example, um, produce liquid fuel for transportation through the fissure drops process um, using the hydrogen and the CO and the CO2. Um, we'll have a look in the next uh, slide. Um, we can use the hydrogen, we can isolate the hydrogen and use it for fuel cells, for example, or we could use it in, uh, uh, to burn it uh, and to produce um, energy directly for combustion of the hydrogen. Okay, so there are all sorts of things that can be done. Um, the capture, um, of course, obviously pre-combustion because the gasification itself already produces carbon dioxide and the, the, the capture itself can be made in different ways. Um, uh, so in particular, um, a very convenient way to capture the CO2 is in situ. So in the gasifier, as the gasification of course and the CO2 is formed, it can be subtracted from the gas through um, reaction with carbon, calcium oxide absorption. So calcium oxide captures the CO2 forming carbonates. And for whoever of you that is familiar with the concept of equilibrium, we are basically, there are a set of equilibrium reactions that um, govern the production of the syngas. When we, um, when we subtract the CO2 from the products, we push the equilibrium towards the formation of these products, in particular, making the seeing gas uh, more uh, hydrogen rich. Okay, um, so it's a good way to um, uh, try to have more hydrogen. Okay. Now, once we capture the, car the, car uh, the carbon dioxide, we need to think about what to do with it. Correct. So there are two ways we can treat the capture carb uh, car car carbon dioxide. Uh, so we can store it 
um, directly by injecting it into depleted oil and gas reservoirs or deep saline formation. Now, the geological characteristic of each single site is can be very different. So um, it's important to run um, a detailed studies of the composition, chemical composition, physical properties of the sites to assess whether the CO2 can be injected in the specific sites. Um, so if you want to know more about the storage, we can, you can, uh, um, you can have a look at this um, lecture. So earlier this week, there was a lecture, a lecture um, called Combating Global Warming, a CCS, the magic, the magic bullet. Uh, some of you may have attended. If you haven't, probably next week, you may find it online on the YouTube uh, channel from this year. Um, I think in a week or so. Um, Okay, so an alternative to storage is utilization. So carbon dioxide can be used um, to do a number of things. Um, it can be used to synthesize fuels and chemicals, such as methanol, ethanol, fissure trap fuels, which are essentially hydrocarbons, okay? As you can see, and as I mentioned before, uh, in order to make these fuels, we need hydrogen, and this hydrogen, we actually need large amounts of hydrogen, and this hydrogen can be um, can be um, uh, obtained through gasification. So this is the benefit of using gasification instead of combustion for biomass. Another way to uh, utilize the carbon dioxide is to use it for building materials. Now this is a actually a sort of a storage method in a way because the carbon um, becomes um, locked up in the building material so it's actually effectively um, a, uh, locked in there, you can't go back to the atmosphere while when we use it for fuels or chemicals potentially at some point well, when we burn the fuel for transportation then this carbon dioxide will go back to the atmosphere so understanding the footprint of the whole process is quite a complicated um, thing but um, because we are we're actually using the, this uh, carbon to produce fuels um, for transformation uh, which means um, that we're not using fossil fuel for the same amount of energy if it makes sense uh, so it's all about the balance. Okay, uh, there are other uses um, that um, for carbon dioxide, uh, which are, for example, it can be used as a food for plants, healed, healed boosting, um, and also uh, a bit less green, unfortunately, as an enhanced oil recovery. It means that uh, some depleted oil uh, reservoirs still have residue, uh, residual fossil fuels that can be extracted um, easily, but we can pump the uh, CO2 in the reservoir and push the, um, help pushing the oil back up. Okay, this is less sort of um, green because we're still getting out fossil fuels. Right, so now this is, this is the general scenario, okay. What are the problems associated to using biomass and carbon capture? There are some questions we need to answer. Is it really that green? Well, as I was mentioning before, calculating the actual amount of CO2 emitted by the ore process from start to end product it's quite complex, it's quite complicated. There are lots of things that come into play, uh, factors such as transportation, heat loss, process efficiency. Um, what are we using the carbon for? Are we, um, as I was mentioning before, if we produce fissure drops and we burn fissure drops, that, that means that we're not burning kerosene, for example, instead. So we are saving on the emissions from the kerosene. But it's quite complex, it's quite complicated. Um, and so for each single process, um, uh, it's important to run detailed carbon footprint and life cycle assessments to then, ass uh, you know, really um, assess the environmental impact of the whole process. And then 
well, there's another question. We've been talking about the environment, uh, the potential of the carbon capture um, from the environmental point of view, but we still have to face uh, the economical side of it because our society still uh, lives, <laughs> uh, well, you know, still relies on economical factors quite heavily, of course. So if a, pro if a process is not economically viable, then it, it cannot go ahead. So storage, um, the storage of carbon dioxide could be expensive for a number of reasons because we need high purity carbon dioxide, which uh, may imply high cost cleaning technologies um, and also um, um, pipelines. I mean, we can use, we can retrofit the gas pipelines um, to um, transport the CO2 into the um, injection sites. Um, but in some cases, we actually need to build new pipelines. So even there, every process needs to be assessed from the economical point of view and see whether it's viable or not. Um, in terms of utilization, in theory, we are obtaining a product that then can be sold. So it represents a, ve a revenue for the company that um, is making the, pro the, the product. However, uh, still the cost of production of chemicals and fuels via CO2 conversion is still not um, competitive enough with um, the traditional pathways, the conventional pathways. Um, however, well, for both these points, this is true actually, this can change any time. Um, and it can change because of um, advancements in technologies, and development of new technologies or optimization of existing ones um, so the process become more efficient for example but also uh, from the political point of view um, there can be policies that are um, implemented it can change completely the scenario for example CO2 taxation so if a company needs to pay a lot of money because it's emitting carbon dioxide then it's better to invest into storage for example or into utilization and that can uh, be more viable. Um, about building materials, building materials seem to be quite more promising at the moment because actually um, uh, cement um, based on the use of CO2 and CO2 and waste seem to be quite economically competitive with um, uh, conventional ones. So that definitely an area where which is um, um, increasingly important increasingly um, uh, interesting okay so let's just have a look at some conclusions now so we know we've been talking about negative emission is it possible to achieve this negative emission so we know that there is an excess of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere which is currently causing increasing environmental issues. It is potentially possible to reduce this excess of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by using the natural properties of biomass, um, of capturing uh, the um, carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere and then coupling it with um, technologies such as carbon capture and storage or utilization. However, there's still a lot of work. The research is still looking for some answers in order to optimize the technology that are already there. Um, and um, in order to basically full, you know, reach the full potential of this um, possible solution. Okay, thank you. Um, I finished with the presentation and I'm now gonna try and answer some questions. Okay, so let me see. Okay, so um, some somebody asked, um, what kind of membranes are typically used to capture CO2? Polymeric maybe? And what are the properties of this membrane in terms of permeability and particle size? Okay, I'm not particularly uh, an expert on membranes, 
um, because I mostly work on um, uh, the um, other types of carbon capture on uh, calcium oxide, uh, but I can definitely uh, look up for, you know, I can send you some uh, material that I have um, about carbon capture if you'd like. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, your attention. I've got maybe another question. So MAE, uh, so what kind of solvents are used for carbon, for um, capture of carbon dioxide? Um, so um, it, 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 sorry, I really have troubles pronouncing this ethylenamines are so amines based um, uh, solvents are used to capture CO2 but again I'm not an expert in this so the process the chemical process that um, um, of course there I'm not completely um, uh, you know prepared uh, into explaining what happens from a chemical point of view but they are called MA um, MEA. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so there is no other question. Uh, I will. Uh, okay, I will. Yes. All right. Thank you very much for this. Bye.